supposed to become limitless, but we're not. We we do have limits, and many people, if they're honest, feel like almost day to day they're bouncing up against dangerously close to their limits. Whether it's anxiety, exam pressure, or managing big emotions and overwhelm, our children and young people have a lot to deal with. Dr. Kate Middleton has written an article unpacking this topic in Roots Children and Youth, issue 131, and it's also online. Today, we're together discussing ways you and your church can support children and young people to have great mental health. Thanks for joining us for the Roots for Churches podcast. Here we go. So, Kate, thanks for joining us. Thank you. It's lovely to be with you. Um, So you're a trained psychologist. What led you into that career and, and why are you passionate about mental health? Uh, Yeah, well, I guess my career journey is anything but planned. So I actually started out as a medic, but my fascination when I was younger was always with the human mind, practically how it works, but also particularly when it's challenging. So I've always been really fascinated by people's emotions and the way that emotions affect us, what they're designed to do, but also how they so often cause problems. It always struck me they were such a fundamental part of the human mind and yet they cause so many problems and I suppose that's been a fascination that's been with me through my whole career but so although as I started as a medic I actually retrained at the end of that first degree and um, retrained as a psychologist because I think I'd realized then this really was the field that I wanted to work in. Mm. And um, after that you have sort of moved and trained to become an ordained minister so tell me about that journey how is yes, how is well, that, that come about? Too, I, I say anything but planned not planned by me but perhaps planned by someone much greater than me so very early on um in my work I started to work with local churches and just I've always been passionate about about the community about the role that the community plays in supporting people and churches do such amazing work right on the front line in so many different fields with people and so I started to work with local churches just supporting them in their community work and that was how I became more and more involved really with that that church sort of space and gradually I guess the the balance just changed so I started to work for a local church specifically overseeing their community work doing lots of work with their local schools and things like that and gradually as I was doing that starting to write and speak and teach much more and more around the bible and theology and mental health more and more I suppose I became drawn into the the church and the the potential of it and just became so excited by that I'm not from a church background of my family of origin are not Christian so I hadn't grown up with that so I think when I first started to become more involved with church it was quite an alien space for me but more and more as I did get get drawn in there was just an excitement and a passion for it that grew. And so gradually that role changed and I actually sort of rose through the ranks of leadership, so to speak, at that church um, and was with them leading for 20 years. And, and then out of, out of the blue, I would say, this call to ordained Anglican ministry um, began to develop and I be- just began to recognize that that was where I was called to be. So that's where I currently am now. And it's fantastic because it's not like you leave those other things behind, you bring them with you and you very much have a role of helping church um, understand mental health and understand how the church can have a vital role in that. You're involved in something called Mind and Soul. Can you tell us a bit about what that is? Yeah, that's right. And that that grew out of uh, a real sort of sense of vision and call to encourage the church to be engaging with matters around mental and emotional well-being. And through that, coming to get to know my amazing colleagues. So in those days, uh, Reverend Will Vanderhart and Dr. Rob Waller, who are two of my colleagues at Mind and Soul, and um, Dr. Chi Chi Obaya also joined us. And we're now joined by Ariana Walker as well, who has just qualified as a psychologist herself so we've we've all been journeying together and but when we first started to work together in those early days it really was a challenge of just getting the church to talk at all around this Mm -hmm. it wasn't really something that was discussed in church spaces so we're thinking gosh 15, 16, 17 years ago. And so that was our early work, really just encouraging the church that this was an important issue, starting to speak about the theology of mental health, well-being, emotions, how the mind is created. And of course, over the years, that has changed and developed. 
as a culture, we speak so much more about mental health and well-being now, which is great. And as a church, we've also improved a lot and, and our awareness and our passion for that has developed. So now I think we have a real sense of a call to shape the conversations people are having to continue to equip and teach around this topic. You know, we love to talk about the overlap of great, great psychology, great psychiatry med with that medical perspective and great theology, the overlap of those three things in this complex but really important area and so that's something that for me and for uh, my colleague Will we're doing alongside ministry and you know with the others also working very much alongside full-time roles that they're called to as well. Mm. It is fascinating because I think in some churches we can feel quite intimidated when we hear about mental health we think oh gosh I'm not sure if I'm qualified let's leave that to the professionals and we sort of push it over to the NHS or to doctors, counsellors, that kind of thing. And we're concerned about sort of overstepping any mark or getting involved. But there is such a huge role that the church can play in terms of community, in terms of support, in terms of, yeah, as you say, that there is a theology around mental health. And what would you say are kind of the, the barriers to churches getting involved with people who are struggling with mental health? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that reticence and what what is a really appropriate, wise caution, I think, can be a barrier. People people are careful, which is a really good thing to be. But the challenge is, is that the, the the sort of the sources of support have changed and developed so much, even just over the sort of twenty years or so that that I've been working in this field. And it did used to be very much that when I first started working, what we would be teaching a lot is sort of where the line is, you know, where, where you hand over to someone else and, and talking about how you do that and the different professional people that you might want to hand over to. The reality is now it's it's really hard to get good support, good treatment, even if you are able to support people to do that. And we always encourage them to engage as much as possible with good treatment and, and the professionals who are providing it. It's, it's rare that that's everything that someone needs. And as you say, the church has this amazing role to play. We are not professionals in that same way, in the same way as, as the, the psychologists, the psychiatrists, the counsellors, the mental health teams. We do life with people. We journey with them. We love them. And so there's a really valuable space there for people as well as receiving that professional treatment just to be developing in friendships and relationships and growing confidence and, and rediscovering who they are and, and how other people see them and, and starting to understand maybe how the Lord sees them. There's, there's such an exciting potential there. And I think in a world where mental health is increasingly a really challenging topic, it's something that fills people with a lot of anxiety, it's really not simple, and the world is far from simple. The church has a really important message to bring, a different story to tell for people and over people, a story that, that might be about hope, even though they're facing dark times. That might be one about finding peace in the middle of situations that feel anything but peaceful. It might be about sources of help that are from beyond our own minds and, and saying that maybe you don't have to just rely on yourself. Maybe there's something else you can draw on. And so I think that's really, really important. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we all know waiting this and um, children, adolescent mental health is seriously oversubscribed and very long waiting this. It can be a big challenge to get help. And the church might end up being the first point of call for children and young people who are struggling with their mental health. So can you give us sort of a broad brushstrokes? Where are we at right now with the state of mental health for children and young people is it bad is it getting worse are there signs of hope i think that's a tricky question to answer i mean in some ways it's a simple question to answer and many people listening will have heard statistics reports very worrying messages about the state of child and adolescent mental health. So there is a lot of concern around. And we know coming out of pandemic that we saw the rates of certain conditions, certain struggles starting to rise or even soar in some cases. But the honest truth is that many of those things were already rising before the pandemic. I think the pa pandemic magnified and brought a clarity to a concern that was already present. 
Certainly coming out of pandemic, there have been some additional complexities for the generations who were at key sort of transitions when the pandemic hit. And we're still, I think, unpacking that and working out what the long term impact of some of that will be. But there are so many other concerns. As I said, the world is far from a simple place. And so I think there's a lot of anxiety around both for parents and adults, those caring for children and young people, but also for them themselves. You know, I think they are often told a story that feels relentlessly negative. And so for us as the generation trying to support them and equip them, our challenge is how we help them deal with those messages as well as dealing with the world that they're in, how they deal with the, this, these sort of stories that are being spoken over them all the time. And so I'm really passionate about trying to help young people realize that even in challenging times, it, it is possible to not, not just sort of muddle through and survive life, but maybe even to thrive and, and teaching them the most important skills how to build your life on solid things that will hold even when the rest of your world feels like it's shaken. And so I think, I think these are times when it's important that we do talk about mental and emotional well-being for children and young people, but also that we remember it's not all about the illness, not all about the negative. We, we also need to be having conversations about what it looks like to, to help them live life well, to find what it means to be well. Mm. So. What can a, a leader or a volunteer in a church do to proactively support and help children? Um, not just when they're struggling, as you say, but to, to generate healthy mental health, you know? Yeah, I mean, so I think I would probably say two things in particular. So the first is about just creating safe spaces for conversations. And whatever the topic, whatever the thing is that's kicking off in that moment, there's always there's always something. I've got I've got two children. I've got a, a twelve year old and a, about to turn nineteen year old. And and even with my daughter who's nearly nineteen, there's still there's always something kicking off that she just needs to process. She needs to work out what she thinks about it. She needs to assess all the different opinions and things she's been reading and hearing and seeing. And and it's really hard for children and young people these days to find spaces where they can do that, where no one has an ulterior motive no one's trying to sell them something nobody's trying to convince them of a certain opinion no one's trying to tell them what to think or sell them something or or that's really quite tricky so one of the most valuable things we can do is create genuinely safe spaces genuinely open spaces and that's not always easy because if we're honest we, we are biased we as, as parents, we're definitely biased. We definitely want them to agree with us and do what we think is the right thing. Uh, even as leaders, though, we, we want them to make choices that feel like healthy choices. We want them to come to the conclusions that are the ones that, that we're trying to teach them. So we have to, to, to hold that honestly and be quite wise about how we do it. But the more we can create spaces for them to have those conversations, the, the better. And the more they know that there are those spaces they can go to, the better. You know, one of the challenges as children grow, particularly through adolescence, is that they their minds are really really focused on developing independence. So they instinctively start to to not want to talk to parents so much. This this is disappointing as a parent, although I'm very blessed that my two still seem to want to talk to me about the most complicated subjects in their lives. Mostly, I'm blessed. Sometimes that's quite challenging. <laughs> but therefore, what what our kids and young people need as they grow is other other people they can go to other spaces they can talk so if, if you're a youth leader if you're a great friend of a child or young person if you're an aunt an uncle godparent whatever that is that's a hugely valuable thing that you can do mm -hmm. and so then the second thing I would say is don't wait for things to become a problem before you start talking about them and that might be how to deal with social media or when to turn off your mobile phone or whatever the, the current issue is. But also it's just helping children and young people to learn about their minds and their emotions and what they are. So we are in exam season right now. So we know that children and young people will be experiencing some anxiety rather than waiting for that to become a problem, starting to talk about, gosh, you know, whenever something really matters to your mind, one of the ways that it signals that is that it triggers anxiety. You know, what does anxiety feel like? 
you know, how does anxiety differ when it's the spider in the corner of the room that you're scared of? Or it's an exam that you actually do have to sit in a week. So talking about some of those topics, sharing how we manage those things, helping children and young people put words to those weird feelings that they're experiencing and being proactive around some of those topics. That's, that's really valuable. So that's the second thing that I would say that people can do. And can I interject there? Because I think I've noticed a generational change. So um, I don't know that I grew up with some of this language of like we didn't talk about anxiety <laughs> you just mm. you know um there were just lots of things we didn't talk about and so i i wonder if sometimes as parents or even youth leaders we're trying to have conversations but we haven't always got the language ourselves or we're learning it ourselves so we feel like this isn't something i'm totally secure in but i'm i'm willing to have a go but it it can feel a bit um well, it can it can cause anxiety, I suppose, that I want to give good advice. I want to model something well, but I'm not sure I've I've totally nailed this myself. And here I am trying to encourage my child or a young person. Here's how you deal with anxiety. And when when, in fact, I reflect on myself and go, well, I don't always handle my own anxiety really well. Um, so are there are there tools, are there resources or is just that vulnerable authenticity helpful um, when talking to young people about anxiety? Yeah, I, I mean, I think authenticity is, is always important, but, but, but not ending in hopelessness. So saying, gosh, actually, I, I struggle a bit with this myself. Let's, both, let's journey together and try and find out more about this. I think that's really helpful. But I think recognizing, yes, that as a generation, we often do struggle. And I think there's two things going on there. I mean, our, our generation of parents, it's, it's so funny because um, I was talking to uh, a young adult the other day about the issue of sort of, burnout and and stress and anxiety and um he was saying to me well basically my generation's aim is to just not be like your generation which really made me chuckle and i think they we are a generation who have who have often really struggled with some of these topics and, and we have now sort of parented and led through the pandemic and through some of these latest challenges and, and a lot of people are really struggling if we're honest a lot of the parents i talk to you are themselves really struggling so so that's that's a valid challenge the second thing is that we are also immersed in this culture that our children and young people are immersed in where when we hear about a lot of emotions like anxiety sadness um we hear about them in the context of illness mm -hmm. and so it's quite hard to think about those things as actually part of the normal healthy functioning human mind and what that also means is that when and i know this as a parent even though i'm a psychologist when our children come to us and they say you know, I'm, I'm feeling terrible. And it's, it's hard for us not to freak out. Basically, you hear the, the word anxiety, and your mind immediately links that with all the terrible stuff that you've heard and all your worst fears for your children. And, and so in those moments in that conversation, you're holding not just their emotional load, but your own as well. And sometimes that feels really overwhelming. And so I think it's good to good to to name that and to, and to talk about it and and to recognize that actually what we need to do is help our children learn to hold some of those emotions with confidence and that might require us to learn how to do that first so yes i think again not waiting until these things become a problem having a curiosity for example about anxiety about how that works and there are some resources, some great spaces that you can do that. And if you are coming from a faith perspective, I, I mean, I am hugely passionate about, about the Bible and some of the things that it teaches us about our emotions, about the way our minds were designed. But I would say sometimes there's some there's some quite rubbish teaching out there. My my family will tell you that one of the things most guaranteed to get me grumpy is when I see an, an unhelpful teaching perhaps out on social media you know saying um you know faith is the opposite of fear which sort of implies that if you have enough faith you won't experience any fear or anxiety and that's just not true the human mind is designed to experience anxiety it's an important emotion it keeps us safe it signals things that might be significant in the world around us it helps us know what to focus our attention on you know it's there for a purpose it can become overwhelming though. And panic is a very different emotion. And, and actually most of the biblical writing is talking about overwhelming panic um, and, and giving us an encouragement, a reassurance that we don't need to be overwhelmed and pushed into that place of panic when we feel natural anxiety. 
So I think, yes, doing some reading, knowing some good sources, knowing where to go if you read something and think, oh, is, is that true? I'm not sure. Um, I think that's, that's a good tip. So what you're saying is that there's a whole spectrum of emotion and that it's really unhelpful when we start labeling them. These ones are bad. <laughs> These ones are unhealthy emotions almost. The, the feelings themselves are not healthy or unhealthy. It's just kind of where we go with them. If we stay stuck in them, that, that starts to be unhealthy. Um, yeah, I can almost I think... imagine like over, over like too much joy could potentially get a bit weird at some point. You could never be able to function if you were just, I don't know. <laughs> Well, it's true. It's interesting. So, uh, year, years ago, I did a study with um, with young people, with t with teenage secondary school age students, actually, and and then it intrigued me so much. I started to talk to some adults as well, and um, I was asking them what you think the sort of normal healthy emotional range is like, and and we used a scale that went from ten at the top to minus ten. So all the negative emotions are in the naught to minus ten. All the positive ones are in the naught to ten, and we basically got people. I sort of said if you were going to to draw a sort of trace on a graph of your emotions over the average sort of days, weeks, months, you know, what do you think it would look like for most healthy people? And almost everyone draws something that's basically in the eight to 10. It's like right at the top. It's like superbly happy. Um, and actually the reality is if you then ask people to do it, which I then did, what people draw, so healthy adults, because your emotions are more stable once you're into adult life, it's basically something that sort of poodles around between about minus one and two. So when we're, if, if you're going through a reasonably calm stage of adult life, um, and, and you're, you know, lucky enough to be, to have, you know, had a really reasonably good experience. So you feel reasonably emotionally well and healthy. You're quite good at, if your emotions drop, you're quite good at, at sort of balancing that, doing something to cheer yourself up, making those adjustments. And, you know, we have some days where we feel happy, but the honest truth is adult life gets fairly dull. You know, it takes quite a lot to push us up into that eight to 10 zone. Teenage emotions are much more up and down. So the good news is they get much more of the eights to tens, but they also get the minus eights to minus tens much more than we do. So uh, much more sort of extreme and challenging in that sense. But I think it's really helpful to have a, a, to sort of normalize our expectation. You know, normal healthy emotions is not about going around sort of in that eight to ten zone, madly happy all the time. Life, normal life is surprisingly boring and sometimes challenging and so if if our expectation is that to be healthy we would have no anxiety no sadness that we would be in that eight to ten zone we're, we'll be disappointed but also the risk is we might be very fearful because we might be pushed into a space of anxiety by something that actually is relatively normal and and then if you think about a season where things are more challenging maybe you are sitting your GCSEs or maybe someone you love is unwell or, or you've experienced a bereavement. The reality is normal emotions then can be really brutal and tough and that's painful and it's difficult and we have to hold that with people and help them journey through it. But we can't eradicate it. We can't protect them from it. That, that is normal emotional life. Yeah. And I think, as you say, like as a, a parent or a young per, uh, or a youth leader watching young people who are going from eight to minus eight on a weekly or daily basis, it can feel a bit like, wow, rein it in or that's a lot or is it really that big a deal? But it is. It is. And, and everybody will have a different sort of I want to say like a sign curve of like how high or low they they feel those emotions. Um, and we shouldn't be projecting our own onto them just because we're sort of <laughs> middling around it too um but I guess that question of like what are the skills that build resilience or build emotional health that like we've talked about sort of naming emotions but and and sort of you were talked briefly about um doing things to cheer yourself up but how can we coach children and young people like when you are feeling lots of anxiety when you feel like your emotions are really high or really low what can you do um to, to make sure that you stay healthy with this yeah and, and I think we can teach them directly in the moments so talking about okay so you've had a rubbish day you're feeling really low why don't we try a couple of things out and see if it helps and and literally talk to them about learn everybody needs to learn how their own mind works you know if you think about how do you relax people think knowing how to relax is just an instinct but actually I most people need to learn and some people are 
really bad at it. They really love stimulation and income and and so income and it's indirect, you know, stuff coming at them and mm. busyness and all of this. And they're actually really terrible. You know, I'm I'm married to uh, my husband is a is a lawyer and he's a classic for that. He loves a deadline, lots of stress, lots of action, people, loud, busy spaces. He finds it really hard just to switch off and relax. But he is a human being, so he does need to sometimes. And so if you're more like that, you're you're going to have to learn. You're going to have to be quite analytical, try different things out. Um, you know, go out for a long walk. Does that help? Does does exercise help? Does reading help? Try lots of different things and, and learn about yourself. And the same comes to how do you manage anxiety? You know, um, sitting down doing a puzzle. You know, if I was anxious, that would push me over an edge. I just can't think of anything worse. But for some people, that restoring of order the calm the focus is absolutely perfect when they're in a, you know a moment of stress or a season of stress so we we have to be analytical so with kids we can we can help them to learn that stuff literally try stuff out chat about what works and what doesn't um and help them deal with the emotions it, it makes me laugh because I often talk about you know we need to learn how to manage things like frustration I mean how many adults do you know who are terrible at that neither me or my husband are great with frustration if we're honest and so you know I, I would talk to people about how a great thing to do is try going bowling because it's just the most frustrating game ever <laughs> and and you know we can grab these moments with our kids when they're getting frustrated and and try and help them it does make me laugh because I was I'd literally taught that once when I was away at a conference recently and I'd just come out of talking and I got a message from my son and he was like oh, I'm so mad and I was like mate what's the problem he's like dad's taken me bowling <laughs> and so I was testing and said well this is a great opportunity for you to learn how to manage frustration and I just got this barrage of message say you talk a lot of nonsense and <laughs> So it did. maybe maybe not every time they're madly frustrated, but I think over, there are direct moments where we can tackle some of these things with them, where perhaps the the you know it's not not the most intense moment, but we can start to talk and teach them. But the other thing I would say is we can just build these things into the rhythm of our lives. You know, um, with with both my kids at different stages. We, we've we've had to do very different things to help them have these safe spaces to have conversations, but also just learn how do you get away from things that are stressful. So my my daughter and I used to go for what we called her existential crisis coffees, where we would just go and sit in a coffee shop, or in the pandemic we'd go and sit on the pavement outside one and and just chat basically. And and that's now I know quite often if if she's because she's off you know being a student now, but if she's having a tough day, she will go and do that. She takes herself off. She goes and finds a really Really nice coffee shop a really nice coffee and it, and it helps soothe her soul my my son was is much more active he finds it quite hard to sort of sit and chat and focus like that so we used to go on what we call mum's walking club which is how we now have a dog which I don't actually that has not improved my stress levels and I don't know how I ever got talked into that but but that's how that started because just going out striking out into the fields out into as near to wilderness as you can get in the middle of a city really helped him and something about the the activity and the focus and also being side by side enabled us to chat and helped him process so you can build these things into rhythm and it, it's good for us as adults sometimes to think gosh in the busyness of family life where are those rhythms that help us manage stuff that help us deal with stress that help us drop down to a better relaxed state that help us process help us talk about things and if you already have those rhythms in place then when your kids then do sail into one of life's storms you've got the spaces already to have the you're not suddenly thinking oh my goodness what I need now is a space to have conversations with them because those spaces are already there so it will make it easier then to support them hmm. and you're teaching them great skills as well at the same time teaching them how do you make sure that you have space in your schedule for those really vital rhythms you know so many of us we do things for our physical health you know maybe you try and go for a run or you try and eat healthy but how how good are we at doing that stuff for our mental health we tend to wait until we've collapsed mm -hmm. and then we do something about it but teaching our children how to build healthy rhythms into life is is a really valuable lesson Indeed. And I think sometimes in church, just coming back to like what church and, and volunteers there can do, we can be quite, I don't want to say program driven, but kind of content driven. Like we need to teach the Bible. We need to um, 
get through this curriculum, we have this sort of agenda with what we want to do with the children or young people when we have them in our groups at church. And sometimes one of the more powerful things we can do is create that safe space to talk, mm. create more open-ended spaces where anything can come up or when children can talk in smaller groups with adults who might be safe for them. And, and I think one of the things I really enjoy about uh, the Roots resources is there's this little section in the children's um, called Talk Together and Talk to God. And it's just asking open-ended questions, but also encouraging that God wants in on this conversation, that that we can talk to God about these things that worry us or these things we don't understand yet. And it's not always that the the group leader is meant to give the right answer and the kids go away with lots of knowledge in their head, but that they are equipped with some tools to to just talk about these things and puzzle them out together in a group and puzzle them out with God. And um, yeah, I, I think we, we don't have all the answers with our children or with the young people, but it is, I think it's such a good skill to be able to, as you say, create those safe spaces where they can, they can ask and they can keep processing. Yeah, definitely. And, and perhaps the most challenging thing about 21st century life is when it does push us beyond our own resources or we feel close to our limits, you know, the limits of our energy or our creativity or, you know, um, we just feel completely overwhelmed. I mean, so much of mental health struggle comes from just an absolute overwhelm. And in those moments where you feel at the end of yourself, you know, is, is that the end? Or actually, can we teach our children that, that there is somewhere they can go in those moments, that we can draw on something that's bigger and better than ourselves? You know, our culture says that to be successful, to be healthy, all of those things, we have to become superhuman somehow, able to cope with all this stuff, able to succeed and achieve brilliance in absolutely everything, you know, pack things into life and, and sort of achieve superbly in every single little thing that we do. We're supposed to become limitless, but we're not. We, we do have limits and many people, if they're honest, feel like almost day to day, they're bouncing up against dangerously close to their limits. But the Bible teaches us something really different, which is that you don't have to do this on your own. And that actually in the moments when your mind feels overwhelmed, when we hand things over to God, we can experience a peace that comes not from our own minds, but from something beyond human understanding. And, and perhaps that's the most valuable lesson that we can teach our children. What does that practically look like? How do you hand things over to God? How do you do that as part of your rhythm, part of your practice? What does that look like when you're feeling okay? And what does it look like when actually you do feel really stressed and at the end of your tether? Because it, it will probably look different in those times, how we pray. So in those moments, as you say, and it's great that the, your resources really encourage this with the children, but thinking about different ways to connect with God, what are the loud ways when you feel like you need to be loud? What are the quiet ways when you need to be quiet? And I, I think helping us have a really good toolkit of how we can do that is, is going to be probably one of the best gifts that we can give children. Mm. Yeah. And as you say, it's normalizing and tools um, to express ourselves to God and to each other. Um, and th I think there's also something about that creativity of mm. um, every person is different and we're going to express ourselves differently. How How do we... I don't know, how do we use creativity? How do we use art, music, um, yeah, just even sport or being outside? Those different ways of connecting with God but connecting with each other, they have a huge impact on our mental health and our resilience. They, they're all tools, and I think sometimes we can get a bit like prayer is sitting with my hands folded and my eyes shut in a pew. And um, And there are many ways to pray, and there are many different ways to engage and for some young people I think those would be really helpful whether it's journaling or art um all of that is is such um a different way of engaging in prayer that that, that maybe people haven't experienced before um, and they need to be permission to do that yes I think you're absolutely right and one of the things I love about the bible is just that the 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 sort of gentle ease with which all of those different things are modelled with, with no question, no, as you say, no, we, we are so good at putting ourselves in boxes or narrowing things down. Like you're, you're supposed to do things this way. You have to do, this is how we do things around here or this is, but people are different. And even this, you or me, we will vary. There will be times in our life where we need very different types of support, very different ways of connecting with God, very different ways of 
praying or worshiping or focusing. And I love the way the Bible models that, you know, Jesus approaching people in so many different ways to to connect with them, to be with them, telling stories, using the the landscape around. Sometimes like the disciples on the road to Emmaus, just going for a walk with someone and, and walking alongside them, bouncing conversation back and forth. You know, it's a bit like we were just talking about it with different people, different children need different ways. As, as, as human beings, we also have those very varied needs. And I love the ease with which God just, you know, offers us this open door to connect in so many different ways. Mm, that's good. So um, I want to come back to, we talked a bit about anxiety being a big challenge with young people or for young people and children as well what do you think is the biggest challenge at the moment to young people's mental health i i so i think it probably is anxiety in all of its different forms but particularly because anxiety tends to be piled on top of whatever the original challenge is and a lot of that does come from the narratives that young people are hearing the concerns that are being spoken over them all the time, that sort of negative predictions. Also, anxiety comes comes from parents, those caring for them, but also from within their own minds when they experience what what are tough times. And so I think anxiety often magnifies whatever else we're going through. And and at the moment there are so many anxieties around mental health and well-being. Uh, I, I think that is very much part of what's making this even more complicated than perhaps it would have been anyway. So are there are there ways that we should be speaking, um, things we should avoid saying that that are kind of going to magnify that sense of anxiety or pressure that we're putting on young people? Or is it just something that we need to be conscious of? And I mean, do we over um, overcompensate by being really positive? How do we how do we decrease the amount of anxiety or the pressure that we're putting on young people yeah and I, I think some of this is about these balanced conversations that we've been talking about so talking about the mind emotions things like that in 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 terms that are beyond just illness or this is what you do when it goes wrong but just helping them to develop that understanding of their minds of, of the people that they are becoming and growing into and and so it's some of the sort of foundations that we're setting around their life, their experience, their understanding of themselves and the world as they're growing up. But I think also just in the moment, because a lot of these conversations do come up in the moments, and particularly if you know anyone's listening who's living or working with teenagers, because their emotions do flare up so quickly and can become so overwhelming so suddenly. I think recognizing the impact of overwhelm. <clears throat> so you know your your mind usually when you're dealing with an emotion works in quite a functional way the job of an emotion is to focus your attention on something that might be significant in the world around you and so you experience this combination of changes which have lots of different functions and one of those is to grab your attention if you think about a, an emotion like anxiety it feels uncomfortable it's quite difficult to ignore and it's because your brain is trying to get you to think about something in particular some of those physical changes also set you up in case you need to act or react or do something in the moment, which is great if, you know, there is a spider in the corner of the room, but it's not so helpful if you've got an exam and you need to be able to, to focus and concentrate on it. What they also do then is they, they do focus your mind. They trigger you to think, to analyze, to make decisions about what you need to do. And in fact, even with anxiety, sort of anxiety at, at its sort of the lower levels does help us function better. It helps us focus. It helps us concentrate. It helps us make good decisions. The problem comes when emotions become overwhelming or when a smaller emotion has, has hit us in the middle of a, of a much more difficult day. So you were already feeling quite close to your limit and then something small happens and it just pushes you over an edge. I mean, we've all had days like that. And what happens then is your brain goes into a kind of emergency mode and it's designed for life's real emergency moments to, to help you to just, just react quickly, get yourself out of trouble as quick as possible. And one of the, 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 well, there's two things that happen then really. The first is that your ability to think and analyze and rationalize drops like a stone. It, it's, it's turned right down. So you find it very hard to think clearly. Everything just feels impossible. You can't 
think of possible solutions, things you could try to solve this problem. It just feels like it's absolutely impossible. You're doomed. It's a disaster. And at the same time, your brain triggers this emotional response, which is really powerful. People talk about a mist that descends or feeling like they're drowning. Just suddenly you get this rush of people will often talk about dread or panic or fury if it's that other sort of group of emotions around frustration and anger. And in that moment, you just feel like you have to react. You have to do something. And all this is designed to try and get you to do something impulsive to get yourself out of trouble you know, the classic fight or flight, to to hit out, to run, just to do anything really to change your circumstances. But of course, if you are sat in the middle of, you know, GCSE maths and that kicks in, it's not that helpful. Or maybe it's just that, you know, the teachers yelled at you for something. Again, not that helpful if your response is going to be to, 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 to hit out, to shout, to retort. I'm trying to teach my 12-year-old at the moment the gentle art of just keeping your mouth shut when you get into trouble at school because if you say something, you will probably get into more trouble. And so one of the things we need to teach ourselves and children and young people is how do you deal with overwhelm? How do you recognize it first and think, right, now is a good time to say nothing or now I'm feeling like I just need to run, but actually it might not be as bad as it feels. And and how do you drop that emotional level? How do you take a few deep breaths? How do you take just two minutes, if you can, just to get away from the situation, get outside? I often say to kids, young people and adults, get somewhere you can see the sky just for a minute. Watch the clouds, watch the wind blowing the leaves on a tree. Listen to the sound of the rain if it's raining. Just something that just drops your stress level. And if you can drop yourself out of overwhelm, you might find your mind kicks back in and you're much more able to deal with it. And I think they're probably some of the most valuable skills you know, as a parent, I never expect to use my skills as a, as a psychologist as much as I've had to use them in the last four or five years. The world has been tough. And probably some of the ones I've used most has been teaching my children those skills. How do you drop out of overwhelm? Teaching them breathing exercises, teaching them practical skills. And, and for us too, in the moment when something kicks off, or if you're a leader, you, gosh, I mean, I've led, I've led church children and youth groups and those moments when we are just absolutely in overwhelm because there's 50 kids in the room and it sounds like they're all talking at once and you're supposed to be you know folding an origami star with them and it's just oh my goodness so for us too how do you think I am actually in overwhelm right now and I I need a moment just to take a few deep breaths to calm things down otherwise I'm not going to be my best self and I'm not going to model something good for these kids yeah I think they're really helpful tools. And I think one of the other challenges for young people is their phones, social media, um, all of that kind of external pressure um, piling on top. And sometimes I think probably adults and young people use mobile phones as a way to deal with anxiety. Um, I'm just going to sort of switch out of this room and I'm going to go on my phone. And it does sort of work. It can lower anxiety. It, well, it does something. I'm not sure if it actually gets rid of the anxiety. But what what do we say to young people about their mobile phones? Are these helpful tools or do we need to put more boundaries around them? What can you advise us? Yeah, I mean, they, this is probably the number one topic that people ask me about at the moment because it's very much in the press. It's being very debated about. And I think for good reasons, there are some concerns being raised about it. It's not just about phones in essence it's about what they are connecting young people with as you say the question is when you pick up your phone where do you go and does it help or does it actually make things worse worse both in the sense of does it generate more anxiety but also in that sense of overwhelm you know one of the challenges of phones is that they have made life very relentless and that can be really good you know i i love chatting and you know social media it's all great but actually, your mind wasn't designed to be constantly stimulated. And a lot of the natural spaces in life that would have helped us just drop down our stimulation level are now filled with phones. So if you have a spare moment, you tend not to just stare at a space or look at the clouds in the sky. You tend to get your phone out, scroll social media or text someone or something. And again, that's not necessarily bad. But it, if, it, if it becomes relentless, that's that sort of pressure on your mind does build up and up and up. And, and we know children and young people because their lives are so much more vibrant and complex and the social complexity of their world is so great. 
some of them are finding it really hard to escape from that. You know, the anxiety. They turn off their phone for now. I remember making my daughter when she was much younger turn her phone off for church. And and she came to me at the end and she just held it up. And it had something like 234 notifications on it. And she was like, do you see what you've made me do? This is how behind I am with the world. And I was like, oh my goodness, most of those are probably just people talking about their breakfast or something. I, I feel you've probably not missed that much. And I, actually now, if we listen to the stats, that's probably quite a low notification rate for now for your average teen these days. It can be thousands of things, just ping, ping, ping. It's constantly coming in. And we do need to recognize that that, that is actually a barrage for young people's brains. So teaching them about boundaries, just talking about that. I mean, many adults I talk to don't realize um, emotional interact, emotional, uh, social interaction, I was going to say, sometimes it's emotional, but just social interaction is one of the most demanding things for your brain. It's good. We're designed to need connection with other people, but it requires work from your mind. And so actually having some moments when you're not interacting with someone, that's important for well-being. And for most of us adults, that just comes naturally from those moments when you're on your own or in a quiet moment. Actually, some people listening are probably thinking, I'm really craving one of those moments. So if you're in one of life's phases where even when you go to the toilet, some toddler follows you, then empathy to you in this. Uh, but, but for most of us, hopefully we have those little islands of space in our day. But children and young people don't if they are constantly on their phones. So talking to them about boundaries. And then, of course, there is concern about what they're accessing. So if on social media they're accessing content that might be magnifying or creating problems rather than solving them, that, that is a huge concern and helping them to be wise about what they're reading. And, and there are good conversations happening, particularly for the younger kids, for kids entering early adolescence or at the end of primary years and moving into the teenage years. Should we actually be protecting them from some of that content? Should we be making sure that there are times when they don't have their phones, when they are switched off, that there are some things they can't access. And I think those are good and important conversations. Age boundaries on social media apps are there for a reason. I know your children hate them. My uh, 12-year-old is literally counting days until he turns 13 and then will be allowed to have access to some of these things. But some of them he won't have as much access as he hopes for because actually there are some important boundaries that we do need to hold for them. On the whole, though, I'm, I, I'm in, in favor of supporting children and young people. So rather than just removing things completely and banning them, I think particularly in the teenage years where their job is to start to become independent from us, their job is to start to become adult, to start to make good decisions. Actually, what we need to do is equip them to start to make those decisions. So holding very wisely how much access they have having those conversations and having them incessantly because there it's just there is so much challenge and demand there are so many things that we need to be talking to our kids about creating those safe spaces for them to talk to us about trying not to be too reactive ourselves mm -hmm. or just tell them the right answer but helping them process and think about making their own decisions well and I think on the whole, that, that is helpful, particularly through adolescent years. If we ban things, we just make them even more desirable. And the risk is that they'll find a way to access them anyway. And then if they get into trouble, they won't feel they can come and talk to us. But I think all of these are good conversations to have. And, and there's a lot of wisdom required. And, and talk to me about sort of the addictive nature of, of phones and social media, because there is some sort of, you said, you know, our brain you know, we're trying to calm down, get out of overwhelm. And you can be scrolling on, you know, social media. There is like a dopamine hit that you're getting, which is a bit addictive, but it's not quite as good as going for a run or, you know, going for a walk and seeing the sky, as you say. It's a different kind of hit, but it, it can feel slightly better initially. I think the other, the <laughs> exercise, the, the doing art, the, the cooking a meal, it takes a bit longer, doesn't it? To, to get that feel good factor out of it. And so we default to the yeah. easy option. And it's, it's two things, isn't it? It's how easy is it? So it's so easy to pick up your phone. It takes a bit of effort often to, to do some of the other things, you know, to go out for a run, to leave the house. And, you know, if you're feeling exhausted and overwhelmed anyway, you might not feel it. It's hard sometimes to get mm. yourself to do something else that, that you know is actually going to be good for you in the long run. 
But the other thing that I really wouldn't underestimate is the power of habits. You know, and we do talk about physiological addiction. So things that create a, a, a physical or a chemical reaction in your mind. But also just the power of habit, automatically picking up your phone. It's just there. That's just what you do. That That is also really, really significant. And so this is where healthy rhythms come in. So teaching some of these things, you know, and, and gosh, I'm a parent, so I really do sympathize. These things aren't easy. You know, the conversations I have with my son about we're literally walking through a field with the dog. Why do you feel the need to be looking at your phone at the same time? Like, let's let's leave the phone at home when we go for this walk. Uh, because that's a rhythm that's a practice that we can get into a habit of not having a phone at certain times in certain spaces and so i think we yeah we need to we do need to recognize habit and and i'll be honest we need to ask some hard questions of ourselves mm. so my kids will quite rightly point out that in a lot of ways i'm worse than they are for habitually checking my phone for having it with me for you know the risk that I might pick up messages when I shouldn't. <laughs> so I have had to get better at some boundaries around this and, and develop some better, healthier habits as well. And, and I do think as, uh, in all of this emotional well-being, in all these conversations, the, the question of what are we modeling is important. We, we, we don't have to pretend that we're perfect, that we've got it right, but we do need to be honest with our kids and young people. And we need to, to share our own experiences. And that sometimes is sharing the things that we've not done so well and what we could have done better, as well as hopefully modeling something that, that is a better practice. Yeah, no, that's helpful. Um, and I'm just, I'm just thinking again of like, we've talked about anxiety, we've talked about mobile phones, we've talked about modeling good things around emotions and, and feelings and um, helping us come back down from overwhelm. When it does go wrong, when there are things where people sort of get stuck in negative emotion, um, it's challenging with young people. How do we how do we progress? And I, I realize I'm asking you a kind of difficult question because in any situation, it's going to be unique and nuanced. But are there signs that you would say this is to me, this is like a red flag and this is where I really need to step this up. This this goes beyond my church volunteer pay grade as it were and I really need to talk to a parent or or refer them to somebody medical where do you feel like particularly with anxiety because it is so commonplace at what point is anxiety too much um mm. and 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 with teenagers as well if they're feeling high and low when do we start worrying about depression when when is it a low and when is it really something to be concerned about how do we know um and and how do we know when to step in yeah, and, and so the first thing I would just say is do be aware that these are safeguarding issues potentially. So it's always important to make sure that you're aware of your church's safeguarding policy, to be aware how that how that play comes into play if it, there are mental health concerns, particularly for a child or a young person. And if that isn't mentioned, if it's not clear, then that's a really good conversation to have with your church leader. I think uh, we know, um, I work a lot with 318, the Church's Child Protection Service, and, and we know that mental health safeguarding is one of the, the top concerns for many churches. And we know that they get a lot of calls and questions, and, and that's a great place to go if you or your church leader need some more advice around any of these topics. But I think we do need to recognize uh, that that safeguarding will will sometimes be brought into play when we have concerns about a child or young person or of course a vulnerable adult's mental or emotional well-being so so that's the first thing to say the, the second thing is we, we sort of think about a few things when we're trying to uh, to assess how concerned we should be uh and the the first one is probably something about uh how long have these things been going on for so is there a pattern so is, you know, if if this is just a, a really bad teenage day, and but the other the pattern otherwise for this young person is that they're sort of healthy, that they seem to be doing well, that there aren't other areas of concern, then that's obviously something much less likely to 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 need action than if this is a real pattern. Actually, this is something that's been happening a lot. It's 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 something that's becoming quite dominant in this child or young person's life. That. There's there's a change. There's a point at which you start to become more concerned. The second thing then is um, how long has this been going on for, and how severe is it? So when we're talking about an episode of say something that looks like low mood, 
how severe is that is a very important question and how long is that lasting so as well as is it just a pattern how frequently have they had these episodes when they hit them is this just a, a moment you know a couple of hours later they're back to normal everything seems fine or is this something that's much more entrenched that they're really struggling to get out of and I think the more we're seeing patterns that have been lasting for a long time and a magnitude where things are really, really sort of feel out of the ordinary pattern of what you might might expect there, we're starting to be more concerned. And then the third thing is, is this starting to have a wider impact? And these things obviously all go hand in hand. So thinking about things like what's the normal pattern of life looking for that like? for that child or young person have they started to drop out of things to withdraw are they struggling with things that would be normally part of uh, of the normal day-to-day -day rhythm you know school friendships is it having an impact on other things in their health so patterns of eating patterns of sleeping other well-being concerns are there other health concerns are they, are they struggling with headaches or stomach aches or things like that that might just make us have additional concern and obviously sometimes uh, issues with emotion with mood, low mood they can push children and young people into other things that they're trying to do to help them to cope so issues around eating self-harm um, as they get older even substance abuse misuse we've talked about phones even things like uh, gaming or um, starting to really struggle to engage with the real world and becoming more and more drawn to gaming and online worlds. These are all things that might lead us to be much more concerned. And of course, if we have any concerns for that for risk for harm to a child or young person or that they might cause risk or harm to someone else these are immediate red flags so if we're talking about things like self-harming where there might be really serious concerns to them or someone else's well-being immediately they would uh, draw you into your church's safeguarding policy mm, that's really helpful because we we know we're walking alongside people um it ebbs and flows doesn't it and so it's knowing <clears throat> when this when this is too much um, are there resources that you would like to point people to, um, good places to go to get more information or to point young people to? There, there are. Let, let me just say before we move on from that, and, and this is a bit of a, a bit of a safeguarding conversation, but this is, this is a really good area where actually recording concerns is really valuable because when it comes to looking for a pattern of concern about a child or young person's emotional, mental well-being it is pattern you're looking for so i think particularly if you have lots of different leaders perhaps say in a church group lots of different people who might interact this is this is where we might notice a pattern if somebody's noting down you know so so, so and so was struggling a bit with anxiety today so and so shared these concerns so but, so i would just say that in terms of practice this is where it's really useful to make sure that you're having good communication between different leaders that concerns are being noted and we're not doing that to be obsessive or controlling or keep tabs on our children and young people it is just about making sure that if there was a problem that needed to be recognized that it would be picked up it's good practice so yes it's it, it's another good reminder of why those uh, sort of good practice things are so important in terms of resources yeah there's there, there's some great stuff out there and and what i'll recommend are some resources that will also then link to other resources because otherwise we'd spend the next hour going through all the great things that i've seen that's really helpful but there are a few good spaces to go so the first thing is a website that we actually launched during the pandemic which is aimed at sort of um adolescence so sort of end end of primary through into those teenage years although we see some variability with what age groups connect with it and that's um, a resource called headstrong uh, so that's at beheadstrong.uk or if uh, you search on social media for be headstrong you'll find that and that's really designed to be a space talking about mental health and well-being in its widest form so how do we manage our emotions what are our emotions all of those sort of wider topics as well as some stuff around um, mental illness, some of the common conditions that children and young people struggle with, and also some great practical tools. So um, how do you distract yourself if you're having a rubbish day? How do you calm yourself down if you're feeling anxious? Some things like that. So definitely some stuff there worth checking out. For adults, whether you're a leader or a parent or a, a friend to a child or young person, there's a couple of 
sites that I would recommend. So um, for leaders in particular, the Mind and Soul Foundation, which is the organization I'm one of the directors of. So we're at mindandsoulfoundation.org. So lots of articles, resources, and things there. We're actually in the middle of um, updating our website and hope to relaunch sort of in the next couple of months. So do keep an eye on that uh, because it'll be all clean and tidy and with a new order coming soon. But um, there's a huge uh, wealth of resources on there. You can search for particular topics and things like that there. And then I would also recommend Youthscape, which is a youth organization that I have uh, been privileged to partner with and work a lot with as well. And they have a fantastic website full of information. Uh, they also have a mental health hub. So if you go to youthscape.co.uk forward slash mental health hub, it's again, just such a brilliant library of resources around all sorts of things. And you, there's also a link there that you can ask questions and have someone respond to you. So if you're looking for something and you can't find it, um, that's a great place to go. That's really, really helpful. Thank you, Kate. And thank you for your wisdom on all of these things. Um, it's been really insightful and I'm sure we've got lots to go away, lots of conversations to be had and, and think just being authentic with each other. And um, I do hope that um, children's and youth leaders who are listening will feel encouraged and equipped that, you know, little steps, little conversations, they all make a big difference. And um, yeah, that we're all in this together supporting each other and the children and young people to have excellent mental health and to to rely on god to to meet us when we are overwhelmed thank yeah. you for your time kate yeah and just thank you to all of those listening we know that one of the most protective factors for a child and young person who's hit challenges is do they have someone another adult other than a parent to go to do they have a safe space to have those conversations in my kids lives those people have been some of the most valuable people in their lives and I'm so grateful. So to all of you who are those people for children and young people, thank you, well done, keep doing it and just I just pray loads of blessings on you as you hold the emotions of those children and young people who you're supporting. Brilliant. Thank you, Kate. It's been great. Thanks very much. One of our core values at Roots is authenticity. We write resources that help churches foster deeper connection, communication and belonging. Each week we provide games, drama, songs, art, discussions and stories that can facilitate each person connecting with God in their own unique way and contributing to the group. Knowing others and being known. We create the resources so that you can spend your limited time doing ministry, building relationships and connecting. Roots offer weekly resources for Sunday services, children's and youth groups, small groups, school groups, seasonal outreach, and so much more. Explore our resources and take out a free trial via our website, rootsforchurches.com. Thanks for joining us for the podcast. See you soon.